it's live. So I can do the introduction. Um, hello, my name is Rafael de Mast, and I'm the exhibitions manager and the curator for Taller Potriqueño. Uh, I want to welcome you to Taller to Taya Potriqueño. Um, this is the, the Lorenzo Homar Gallery, um, located in the Corazón Cultural del Barrio Latino Center. Uh, this event is being recorded and will be posted on Taller's website. Um, if you do not want to be we're not doing Zoom, so you don't have to worry about that coming out in the recording. But I just want to just acknowledge this, the help from the staff. Um, Dominic Moret, who's helping me with, um, with the recording, and, and John, Joshua Mallory, who's a former Tayer alum student, who's actually right now running his own recording studio, who's helping out with this introduction. Um, and, okay, now our next event is going to be, if you're interested, is going to be the... Um, our, our winter fundraiser, Paranda. You can go to Tayo's website to learn more. But I don't want to take any more time. Um, this is, we have this wonderful exhibition called Another World Exists. Um, my guest, Mar and this is this artist talk with Marina Gutierrez. Uh, Marina Gutierrez is an artist who combines community-based work, public and studio arts. She was also the director of Cooper Union's Saturday program for nearly four decades. Uh, serving over 10,000 New York City people, encouraging many to in, enter the arts. She also exhibited widely and in, in thousands of uh, in pivotal exhibitions such as Caribbean Crossroads of the World at the Queens Museum in New York City, uh, Crayola Factory at Parc de Villette in Paris, at El Museo del Barrio in New York City, and created a solo installation at Project Row Houses, Houston, Texas. She's the recipient of Joan Mitchell um, New York Fine Arts and Mid-Atlantic Fellowships, the LMCC's Swing Space, the Governor's Island's Residency, and two New York City's Art Commission Design Awards for public projects in East Harlem, the Burgess Center, and Prospect Park Imagination Playground. Gutierrez is also the co-author of Art, Vision, Voice, Cultural Conversation, and Community, published in 2005 by Columbia College, Maryland Institute of Art. Um, so without any minute further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Marina Gutierrez. Also Hi, like everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I wish we could be in person, but at least we're in virtual. So this is great. I'm so excited to be back at the Taller. I showed here a long time ago. And this place has grown and flourished. And it's a wonderful element to the community. It's, it's a cultural living you know, icon. Yes, it is. Thank you for coming here and joining us. I also want to, before we start, um, I do, there are some things which I want to talk to you about what we're, about the exhibition. We know that many people haven't had the opportunity to come see the exhibition, which I'm really very excited about. So we did pre-record some parts um, of the show giving you an, give, so giving you, to, to give you an idea. And so there, there, we're, going to be, we're, going to be, we're going to be broadcasting that, then we're going to be following with a Q&A at about 1.45. Um, but before that, I'm also, but I think it's really very important that before that we start off, we talk about the title, Another now, World Exists. I don't know quite how we came up with the title. I think it was Raphael. We had conversations, and you got, suddenly came to this title. But I was very happy and excited about the title. You know, Another World Exists, because the slogan, Another World is Possible, is, um, a call for social justice, uh, a critical call, but also a hopeful call internationally. And two of my favorite writers and thinkers have used it. One is Noam Chomsky, and one is Arundhati Roy, who has a great quote. Uh, I'm going to read just so I don't stumble. So she says, another world is not only possible, she is on her way, and on a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. So the idea of hope coming, living with us, even though a lot of the work here is critical and some of the subjects may be challenging and sorrowful, that hopefully it's overall hopeful. Yeah, that's I think that's probably why when we were having our conversation looking at your work, that's um, that we came to that title. Because even though um, there was some critical thought, I always thought there was something very um, positive, and actually, most importantly, actually full of agency. Yeah. And that's you know, so there's, 
and we will talk about it maybe as, as we go along with the video. I do want to say that um, we would love to hear, get your feedback and your impressions about the work and about the conversations. Feel free to, uh, to leave your comments in the chat box. Um, later on in the conversation, we, will, we would like to get back to it and hopefully answer some of your questions. Um, so I think this is, a good, this is a good time to start with the videos. Well, we were going to talk about the beginnings of the work. And people ask, how did you become an artist? And that's what, of course, Raphael asked me. Oh, yes. And my answer is that it began as a child in probably play and making things with your hands, uh, creating your own toys, changing the, you know, the, the yard around if there's a yard or the beach around if there's a beach and building things and structures, which maybe references the agency mm -hmm. that we're not passive in the world, but we can actually change the world and build and create our world. Yeah, that makes it perfect. Yes, we were talking about building and, and building and playing, and, and, and you were in, in playing is something something you've you've off, you've said a lot, you've talked about in some of your work in the way that it doesn't it, it isn't something that's always that it is planned, but it, but it does it does kind of emerge in the pro, in part of the process. And, um, and the first video clip that we're going to go through is uh, room for recollection, right. which. It's an older piece, 2000, and it involves sort of construction and elements of play. That's right. So, Dominic? Slave trade, um, sugarcane, and also the products that come out of it, alcohol and such. So, in 2019, mm -hmm. just prior to COVID, I experienced a kind of personal that's, dislocation that's and isolation that I was uh, cut from a job and a mission that I'd been working on for decades with people. So I did a couple of drawings. Um, COVID started, and then we really were isolated and couldn't visit in the way that we might have if it hadn't happened. So I did drawings of people that I had worked with, coworkers, friends, people that I missed. And I did these two drawings. Both of them are called We in Water, one and two. And I started with this one. So that's me. My feet are in water. I have on a Vigigante style mask over my face because years ago I had a dream that I was a Vigigante. It's a, a carnival mask that comes from Puerto Rico in this case. It's always male, mine was female, so it's pink. So that's me and I'm on my kayak and I'm connected by this curving filament of water to Aisha, who is a former student. She's an incredible artist, a performance artist, Aisha Bell. And in her shawl, she has my mom, deceased, at the top, who's drinking tea with, on the left, Hei Han Kyung, who's also a former student and an amazing photographer, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, because my mom had the same politics, so I put her in the image. Judah, her, her son, is behind Aisha. Her daughter, Tandy, is in front thinking of fish because she used to go uh, canoeing with me and was fascinated by fish, dead or alive. Um, above, next to where they're drinking tea, is the spirit of COVID, past, present, and future. Uh, and I was thinking of the Dickensian spirits that show up in the Christmas Carol, Christmas Carol, you know, the. Christmas past, Christmas present, Christmas future, which are an admonition to a good life. So I thought of the COVID spirit in that way. And I should also mention that she's standing next to a landscape, which comes off a can, a coffee can, a Vilpico coffee, which is a Puerto Rican product. Um, next to the COVID spirit 
is Corinne Eng, who is the avenging Buddhist angel. In the corner, there's sort of a generic angel. And below is Jairo Sosa, also an amazing artist and former student of mine. And I should mention that I'm wearing a shirt which has printed very small um, two degrees centigrade. And same thing larger in rubbing on the shorts. And the two degrees centigrade refers to the tipping point, the climate tipping point, where after which it's total catastrophe, which is why we're also all standing in water. Um, and little measurements of water and charts and nautical you know, charts behind. And after the recent climate conference that just closed, they're now talking about 2.4, 2.6 degrees centigrade, which is truly catastrophic. So moving down to the second one, I couldn't fit everybody in. And I apologized, but then I thought I should do another drawing and bigger paper, I should be able to fit everybody. So I start again with myself, my two degree shorts, and I'm wearing the Vigigante mask, which has sort of a motif of little circular dots, little polka dots that come up the, um, the horns. I have Mayan speech glyphs coming out of my mouth. I'm holding waves of salt water and so I'm essentially like Yemaya, the Yoruba deity of, um, of water, of salt water, sitting on the kayak. And with me is Tandy, who's gotten a year older, still thinking of fish, you know, sort of subtly in her hair. She's holding sweet water and wearing the yellow of Oshun. Um, Next to me, sharing this water, passing the, this flowing circular movement, um, is Vincent Toro, a former co-worker and a poet, also with the speech glyphs. He's a poet, he's always talking, and he has text on his pants. And he's shown as a double image because he wrote a book, a poetry book, um, Stereo Island Mosaic. And so there he is in stereo. Above is a Caravaggio angel, actually copied from a Caravaggio painting. Below, part of the title of this piece is to swim in a phosphorescent bay illuminated by movement because there's such a bay on the island of Vieques, Puerto Rico, where I have swum. So that's a big water memory. Hard to imagine how to represent that in a still image. Um, we have the COVID spirit as well. Corinne shows up, this time masked. She's very careful. She's a Buddhist angel wearing gloves and mask. This is Alfred Cervantes, also a designer, former student, artist. Um, holding up his newest daughter. Judah splashing in the water, that's Aisha's son. And then two figures here, Nora Rodriguez Valles, and again, Aisha Bell. And in this case, I was sure about the protocol one would use because this is an image of her, Nora, doing a performance uh, Tierra Libre in Puerto Rico. I did it from a photograph of one of her um, stations. She goes to different parts of the island and meditates on a future of uh, freedom. And this one was from a memory of Aisha doing a performance where she washed herself in bluing, doing these ablutions to erase the stains of racism. Um, and I think the energy that one gets from this drawing has to do with these two artists doing their performance, which is why I go into the detail of mentioning it. Um, I then decided for this exhibition to attempt to translate this into 
a sculptural installation. So right next to it in the installation, in the way the, the show is installed, we move on to the sculpture version of these drawings. And you might recognize Vincent Toro with the pants that have text. Um, he's in a stereo image as well. So he's speaking languages um, modern and ancient. This is presuming sort of this ancient reference. There's the water cut into a three-dimensional form, again on aluminum. And the grid becomes the hardware cloth, which is the metal framework. And Caravaggio Angel, which is shown in the drawing in an enclosed space, is actually in a little box and uh, is removable. The legs here, I cast from my legs and I drew water images on them. So this is sort of splashing in water. And I've used this motif various times. So it's not that they're cut off legs, it's imagining that the water is coming up that high. And this one as well has measurements. Um, behind, we have the spirit of COVID, past, present, and future. And she's got a mask. She's made from a mask that recalls to me some of the very frightening masks that I've seen used for um, you know, sacred practices that are not public. And they are truly intimidating. Her hair is made from a root that I found floating in the water. And it's like a Medusa, the Greek goddess that had snakes for hair. And she was kind of, you looked at, if you looked at Medusa, you died. So that works for me. And then her skirt is made with numbers, these very colorful little numbers, which are imagining the death tolls of COVID globally. Um, there's a COVID earring and a moon earring on her. And then here I am as me with my Vigigante mask. And I can show you how I, I match perfectly my, looks like me, no glasses on in the picture. So here I am with my pink Vigigante. Um, here is Judah splashing in the water. And these pieces of wood were all retrieved. They're driftwood, but they're not all natural. They're some worn by the river and some not. The arms similarly are cast from my arms. And there's drawing on them about water. And this is another retrieved piece of wood which has aluminum on as a map of the river. And this, of course, is measuring how high the water will get because the water is going up. Um, So, are we live again? Whoops, technical difficulty. That was not room for recollection. That was a current drawing, um, 2021, and one, and the installation version of it. I hope it didn't last too long in, in the explanation. The other clips are a little bit shorter, and we're gonna go through them. I thought it was important to not just sit in front of something stationary, but actually to move through it. So uh, the videographer, whose local talent comes from the center itself, um, the, the videographer and I moved through the installation to capture some of these shots. So um, in a moment, we're going to go to Room for Recollection, which is the older piece. 
Uh, the, you know, I've always had kind of a dilemma between drawing and three dimensions, and I'll set myself the task of staying flat and doing just drawing. And I'll do it for a while, but at some point, I just cannot you know, resist making something with the hands, going into three dimensions, puncturing the paper, whatever it may be. So I guess in a way, I feel more comfortable in that three dimensionality, uh, in, in the physicality of the hand, in you know, the use of craft, uh, in using contemporary materials, materials from the hardware store, um, recycled materials, whatever it may be, to create what might in other cases be traditional things. So are we good to go for the next? So the next piece we're going to see is room for recollection, hopefully. This is Room for Recollection, based on a Taino house, a pre-conquest house called the Boillo. And if you look it up online, the description is of a hut or shack. But when you look at the old engravings, you see that each wall is clearly held up by a post. And it this appears is, that there's perhaps time. six or eight walls, and I did one that's got, got six walls. This one done already. The roof, which would have been thatched, also seems to always have a little so, circle on top of it. So I don't know if you can times. see in the video, but there's a little circle Four, in the wire, which eight, references that. Um, then it's each like of the four, walls six, has a cube within it. So this first entry cube has a mask made out of basically window screen. And these screen masks seem ubiquitous in the Americas. They're often painted, often painted pink. I've seen them used in masquerades uh, that seem sarcastic or critical of conquest with a brown person underneath. But in this case, I've left it unpainted and ghost-like. The leaf below is roughly a banana leaf. It's in aluminum. And I use that as sort of a symbol for people. The next wall has the cube filled with barbed wire. And below are growing snake plants or Sansevieria plants, which are an invasive species from Africa originally. And the idea here is that there were these places that my family described that they used to go where you can no longer go in Puerto Rico because it's closed off, it's not accessible, and therefore the barbed wire. But also the snake plants, when they grow very densely together, they can be used as fences. So these are fence. The one next to it has, instead of a cube, a little house, like a dollhouse with actual dollhouse furniture in it. Uh, below are plantains. And there's a famous painting by Ramon Frade called Pan Nuestro, Our Daily Bread. And plantains were the staple of the countryside. So there's the painting where he's walking with a big hand of bananas over his shoulder. And this is the reference to that, the house and the pan nuestro plantains. Here on the adjacent wall, this cube is filled with a palm leaf. You used to be able to take things back on the plane in the way you can't now. And then below, palm leaves rendered in aluminum. Um, moving along, we again have the plantain or banana leaf, and above that are photos. On the interior, I'm looking at the photo, which is somewhat degraded over time. Um, on my side, it's palm trees. The shot is actually in Dominican Republic. 
The other side is a family in front of a house in the countryside, which is the, the update to this house. And then the last wall has the cubes stuffed with money, Xeroxed money, photocopied, painted green with uh, interference green so it shines a bit like a false gold. And then below are sugarcane because sugarcane was the cash crop of the Caribbean. It fueled the slave trade, um, sugarcane, and also the products that come out of it, alcohol and such. Well, I just want to, yeah, I think with a hard cut, this is, well, this is room for recollection. Yes. You got to it. Um, and, I, and I love this piece, and, when this, and I definitely wanted to bring some of your installations because I think that's something that you're known for. Um, and I feel like, you know, if you're an artist, you know, who's been working in the field for over, you know, over more than four decades and um, has, has a tremendous body of work in many different materials. And I feel that it's part of the overlay of these installations. And they have a lot of details. And when we were talking about the idea of play, and, um, and I think some of these elements that we see kind of manifesting, because not only did you, did you create the entire structure, you go outside of the stores and you, and you see things, you see things that, have, that, that caught your attention, and then you somehow bring it into your work. Maybe you can tell me, talk, we can talk a little bit about those details. Well, I think, you know, the, the idea basically drives the material. So I have an idea. I wanted to represent home um, with the plantains, you know, the daily bread, pan nuestro. And that came together to a very literal that, that you see the plantains and you see the little house, the little casita. Um, so, I mean, it's similar to the toys. It links in with play. I'm familiar with these things. I brought them back as an adult, as an artist, to speak to this issue of playing house and living the house. Um, the, the materiality of it comes from the intention, you know, so that it may be poetic, but it's also kind of a conceptual structure that you want to have certain information. I, I, trim it down, hopefully, to read according to what my intentions are. So that's where that comes from. You know, that's how those materials are selected. And I walk around picking things up. Um, I walked around, I, I think I picked up the, the leaf, the big palm leaf that's in that cube. I brought it back on a plane. I didn't have a plan for it, but how could you pass up a palm leaf? You know, I don't know if you can do it anymore, but those things, you know, you, you know, you just, it's a way of living, and then you use the elements of the life in what the conversation is. And this is an installation, but it's really a sculpture. It sticks all together. It's not separate. And I think this really, I, I just said before that it's, I always am challenged in, to stay drawing only in two dimensions, but I think of the sculpture as actually drawing. And I think this one is very clearly drawing, you know, because of the linear quality of the hardware cloth, that mesh that creates the walls, because of the way the images are seen one through the next, uh, kind of transparency. It's, it's a way of drawing in three dimensions. But it, I conceive of my work as drawing. Right. And part of the work is also this, um, is that you allow people to walk into the piece, and, and therefore, in my in my perspective, as a person maybe who's looking at it as a, what, at once you could be an observer watching someone become part of the piece, because they, because they're they actually in, um, they're engaging and being meshed by it, and then becoming a participant and an agent of the piece, and and the piece itself, like you said, has a lot of memory of thing, of 
of, of, the, of the migration and the translation, which, is, which are parts of pieces which, which discuss bringing and travel and in, 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 in so doing is you're carrying it within yourself. Well, so in, a, in a sense, you're traveling in the piece right. from each of those segments that tell different aspects of a larger narrative. So you're physically walking from wall to wall. You cannot see everything at once. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it, it sort of implies a kind of cinematic time that you, you're forced to add time to the piece, even though it's not a video. It doesn't have time in the, that sense. But it has time in the sense of you're moving through it. Um, and you inhabit the piece. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's like a little house. There was another casita that I made. But it also went with a series of body masks right. that were wearable art. And we should probably go to that clip if we can. Yes, we can. Um, that's the conjure dress. So I think, I think that'd be great. I mean, it does work with some of the materials. Are we going to the conjure dress? This piece is the conjure dress, which was a series of body masks, constructions of identity. And similarly to the room for recollection, I had pieces that you could either inhabit, walk in, or put on. And this is a wearable piece of art. So I begin with a cast of my face. Uh, on top of it is copper, hammered copper repoussé, so it's all closed off. And this is the one mask that you can't see out of. So it questions remembering or inheriting memories. The skirt is made of a woven uh, steel wire with lace flowers in the steel wire. Uh, these elements are cut from old cans, that's copper piece, but these are old tropical fruit cans. And the reason they're there is because, I mean, pears are not tropical, but the others are. I grew up in New York City. I'm an urban person. I wouldn't know a guanamana if it bit me on the nose. So I just know it from the fruit cans. Uh, here we have other little embedded images, the domestic images and a thorn more domestic images in copper, a little baby, a little corn. But then if you see the interior, you can't look out. And this has to do with a sense of geographic and cultural displacement. It begs performance, and since I'm a shy performer, there's a video which is streaming on the Tayer site, which is my virtual performance, so that's there. The conjure dress is also something really much interested in, interested in me. First, you're still working again with a wire mesh. Would you, would you, would you, would you call it a hardware cloth? Uh, this one is actually woven. I, I got steel wire and attempted to make lace, which is actually really difficult. So I just made it almost like a, a hurricane fence, just a simple twist, and inset lace roses into it. So it's not hardware cloth. That's why it's more flowy and more mm -hmm. flexible. And then it has heavier gauge wire that creates the bodice. Mm -hmm. and you know, fortunate voids where your breasts are, but then the, the mask, which you cannot see out of. Right. I feel like one thing that, you know, this, when you start looking at a dress, it's always something that you, that, you know, in a previous conversation, you said that resonates. It's about poetry and translation. And I feel even though there's, there's something, there's, there's a strong intentionality in, in these kinds of dresses, talking about the um, about femininity and, and, and women's role, mm -hmm. But there's, all, but there's, but there's. I think that it's taking from the idea of the way that you're using a poetic license and in, and in translating these elements in order to carry, in, in order to get your message, 
get, to get your message across. Something well, it's, it's almost literal. I mean, again, you know, you, this is wearable art. And I have to say that at one point, uh, the wonderful artist Antonio Matorell put it on, and he's a man, and he's much bigger than me, but he managed to get it on, and he performed it beautifully. I perform it on the video. I'm a less extravagant performer. But when you put this on, you can't see. So you have to imagine these things in the same way that um, one might inherit memories. I've heard stories of you know homeland, um, places that I did not experience firsthand, but that I heard recounted to me by family. And that's a lot of what I'm thinking about here. You cannot see it. You're not experiencing it directly, but you've heard the stories. Right. But then, yeah, and, and like a lot of you do, even though they're, they're representational of an idea, but I think that's really also very key to my understanding as well, is thinking about the idea that there is something about its utility is being obfuscated. Like, I mean, you're talking about going back to um, House of Recollection, you know, it's not, even though it's representation of the Boia, which is supposed to keep the elements away, um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it, you know, air, it's extremely permeable. Yes. And then, yeah. while the conjure dress, even though it's addressed the most important element, you know, where the idea to be able to look out. Yeah. That's obfuscated. But then there's an inverse happening, and that which in the modesty aspect and what, what's supposed to be kept inside and being protected is com almost completely invisible. There's, yes. a, there's, a, the, there's maybe the corset, and you can talk about it being representational, but the sense of an armor. And it's kind of, and, and it has this, like, if you look carefully at it, you know, which is, you have a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. There are hands and writing. It's almost kind of and like a copper like repoussé, yeah. and again, uh, and again, the cutout of the, the tropical fruits. As I said, I wouldn't know a guanamana if it bit me on the nose mm -hmm. because I didn't, grow, I didn't see them growing. I only bought them in juice, so in batidos. So I know the name, but I don't know the image. You know, so I had the little image on there. And that follows into the, another clip that we were going to show, right. which are, is persistence of sight, um, which has those same uh, cut out images used on the table. So can we go to that clip? Persistence. Your installation, which is titled uh, Persistence of Sight, Sight Spelled as Location, Not Visual Sight. It's Persistence of Sight, and then the acronym GOLD, Gathered or Linked Data. And I repeat the use of the cutouts from cans here on this sort of idea of a country table, similar to tables that I would see in various campos. But here it's covered with this essential tablecloth cut out of metal cans and nailed onto the table. All of these are products of the Americas. And the acronym GOLD refers to what I was taught as a student, that the Americas were conquered, the conquistadors came because of the gold. And that was the true value. But looking at it realistically today, over 50% of food globally was orig originated in the Americas. Therefore, the real value was in the knowledge, and it just didn't happen that it just grew. Some of the things, maybe strawberries just grew, cranberries just grew. But things like potatoes and corn um, took thousands of years of intentional agronomy, of agricultural knowledge to create that. And that is, I think, an important thing to understand, the value of the people creating that incredible wealth that persists to today. So that is the persistence of sight. Um, so we have the varied foods, everything from your guanamanas to your pineapples, tomatoes, uh, et cetera, all on this table are originating in the Americas. Um, peanuts, which are thought often to come from Africa. I have a pair of peanut earrings that are reproductions 
of ancient Peruvian Andean peanut earrings. Theirs is gold, mine is just gold plate. Here, these are just gold plated in reference to those. And then corn here. I have silver corns, but corn is all over. I found corn on street corners in Tanzania, um, roasting on street corners. Obviously, they've had it. You get baby corns in your Chinese food. So corn has traveled the world. And then potatoes and tubers. I don't know how many potatoes there are. We could Google it and look it up, but there's a whole lot of potatoes. And they're incredibly valuable. I mean, there's a history with potatoes. The Irish potato famine happened because potatoes were imported as a monoculture, one crop. And then when they got sick in Ireland, there were no backup crops. In the Americas, there's, I think, literally hundreds or thousands of different kinds of potatoes. So that would not happen. And that's also really important ecological, sustainable concern. So I think there are over <laughs> 2,000 potatoes. Um, we have some friends from Peru who could definitely um, educate us on that. But uh, I was about to look, uh, look it up again. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is an interesting video, the piece right there, the persistence of sight. Again, reflecting that to like visual sight, but of place. In that it, that it kind of that it refers a little bit to the, our historical legacy of which we may not understand its significance. In, in that how, how the Americas have supported and, and changed and was rich before the colonization, which is something which I think which brings a lot to this conversation, thinking about the activism in your work. Um, and, and, I'm, and, this, and, and going a little bit about the subtlety about your work, I feel like you know, you're, you're using items which I like to dress for me in a house, which are really very common, which are these are items which are, we would find in supermarkets or in a grocery store, um, in which we interact daily. But, but may not really think about its significance and how our interaction might might be um, you know might be affecting others. So if we can maybe if you can touch a little bit about that part for me. Well, as a child, what I learned in school um, was pretty skewed and pretty insufficient. I did not hear the story of the Americas that I know now. I did not hear. Um, you know, you know, Thanksgiving was a big celebration along with Columbus Day without acknowledging there was a genocide and that many of us have inherited both, you know, heritages of the, the people who vanquished and the people who lost, um, especially in the Latin American community, but through the African American and, and how this touches everybody. I mentioned the Irish potato famine in there. You know, these are global issues. And the history begins. If you don't get the backstory, you can't understand where you are now. If you, if you don't know your history, I don't know if you're condemned to repeat it, but you're condemned to be confused. And I think most of the education has gotten better, but now there's this big fuss about critical race theory, and I'm not really going to throw around slogans and decolonialization and those things. I just think we need to get to the, the truth um, or the, you know, the actual events and mention the whole story, you know, which is a complex story. And it continues today. I mean, we are living out the, the heritage of these events today. And the commonplace objects, you know, what else would I use but what a dress? I wear dresses. Right. I live in houses. You know, I play with toys. Right. I mean, there are repercussions and there are things we're still living 
through, which I think is a great segue for the, for, for the last video, which is actually worth yeah. short, but I think it's part of a contemporary piece, which was done yes. in 2021. Yeah, we're going to go to the next video, which is the reliquary, Can't Breathe Reliquary. So... This is my second reliquary. It's Lungs for Eric Garner and George Floyd. Uh, I imagine everybody is familiar with the cases of death by hands of police using chokeholds. You know, so while the demonstrators were marching, I had to do something, and I created this piece. Um, these circular pieces of glass are cut from the bottoms of jars, and they sort of work as lenses. The structure is made out of hardware cloth covered with pattern paper. These that are not circular are pieces of glass that I found on the road, on the streets. They're pretty big. They're framed with copper in the same way you would do stained glass and inset into the metal hardware cloth underneath this paper covering. Um, if you look inside there, you see a rope because I think that we should really call these killings at the hands of police lynchings. And lynchings took place for a long time. They continue to take place. They are predominantly against black people, but they've lynched people, you know, with, without discrimination. They've lynched Mexicans and Native Americans and white people and Jewish people and Asian people. Okay. Well. When that's all this piece is, you know, it was definitely like, uh, yeah, it really, it really quieted me. And it's, it's, it's a really incredibly powerful piece. Um, you know, you it's a difficult piece. It's a yeah. difficult subject. Um, several summers previously, they, there started to be video after video of these tragic, horrifying uh, in, interactions between police and civilians. There are so many people. I mean, I did another reliquary for Eleanor Bumpers, which will be on the, the website. Um, <clears throat> you know, what do you, you know, what is the response that you can make? You know, it's in, unsupportable. It's more than you can stand. And people were marching, you know, with great hope and promise. Um, but then again, there's this pushback it's almost, uh, it's, it's almost a replay of reconstruction where you get so far and then the, the forces of Confederacy push down again. And I had this realization that what these are are lynchings. And I got that from reading a book that was written by a, a white writer. And I think that's incredibly hopeful that you know, we as all of us together need to face these issues and concerns. And it was a painful piece to make, it really was. Yeah, there's, a, there's a really strong internal dynamic about the work that you're, you know, you're, that you're really contending. And because I'm also thinking about while you were doing, <laughs> while you were doing I Can't Breathe with the first video, We In Water, talking about you know, uh, isolation, not being apart, but like, like the, all of these, um, you know, like all of these like, real assaults that's happened, you know, the physical assaults as well as mental assaults, they're, we're, they're, they're carried within us. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we're dealing with that. And there aren't any real, there, 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 there aren't any simple answers or simple solutions. And, and I am, and, this in, in, in the way that you were just dealing, talking about, um, you know, that I can't breathe with the, with the actual the physicality of the lung becoming manifest, 
manifesting and then with <clears throat> and then becoming literal with actually with the rope within it. The, the solutions may not be simple, but they do exist. There are yeah. things that can be done. You know? So I, I think to feel hopeless, like this is the only way it can be, you know, another world is possible. Mm -hmm. you know, that's where that slogan comes in. Right. It really could be different. It doesn't have to be that way. That is definitely true. I think, I think we, when, we, when we were first talking about it, I think it's like, like, <coughs> like, like, first, like, kind of like I think we must have first acknowledge it and identify it. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's something that's, that's very poignant, you know, you, you put in your work. Um, because you're, you, even though you're, you might be addressed, you may, you may address it, address it some sense of that you're, you know, <coughs> or indirectly. Mm -hmm. it, is, it, is, it, is, it is, it is a subject of the conversation. And you know, in, in, in which in which you invite the, the viewer to become part of, and, and, and I think, in, in, in definitely, I think another world exists is both kind of a description and kind of a kind of a and verb just to do hopeful incantation. Yeah, um, I was wondering if, we, if I think might be this might be a good time to see if there are any questions that we can answer. Okay. Well, like <coughs> Excuse me. So you literally, you know, just for information, right? we're a part of, of the exhibition, another part of the exhibition this year, room installation we call In Aqua Memoriam. Um, degree, uh, you know, two degrees of water tables. Um, and this was done in 2016. And, some, and this is something we're also talking yeah. about ecology, <clears throat> water, which is another aspect of, of the work that you're, when, when you're engaging mm -hmm. through life. In many different aspects and then in many different permutations, but really kind of um, you know excites me because you actually this piece is done with aluminum foil, which you bought in the supermarket when you came here was a part of the insulation piece. Well, you have this fine materials as wood and then and then and yeah. and metal. And well, <laughs> behind us is the wave wall, which we sat our little kitchen table in front of, and it matches since it's both uh, silver, but the wave wall. It's really not waves that I'm making the marks of. I don't know if you recall being at a beach ever and seeing the indent in the sand, <clears throat> the way the, car, the, the waves carve into the sand a shape that's curved that's similar to waves. It marks the sand. And so that's where I came up with this idea. So it's remembering the waves from the way the sand is carved by them and shaped by them. And on the end of it, it has the ruler, which marks the rising water. Um, I've been doing pieces about water in Aquin Memoriam series for quite a while, um, more than a decade. I'm not even sure how long. And the drawing, we in water, you know, we're all standing in water. I mean, it's so present. It's, you know, it, you know today we could have a flood. You know, there's some place in the world that's got a drought, you know, flood and drought is, I mean, the only thing we need is locusts, you know, it's like right. these catastrophic changes. And meanwhile, they just finished the COP uh, meeting. I don't know what they did, you know, net zero is, is a fiction. You cannot balance, you know, things and make a change. You have to make a change. Um, so it's very concerning, you know, I, I, I don't know, I mean, that's where you really need another world. Right. Uh, because the water is rising, mm -hmm. the water is also disappearing. You know, it's, it's like an incredible duality. There's definitely a lot happening, and I think, you know, and, and again, this piece, I think when you, put a, when, you, when you put the ruler next to the water, it's a question about time, because the idea of rising waters and, um, in action. You know? Well, I've always it lived walking course. distance from the water. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe a long walk, but you know, I grew up, uh, I was born in Manhattan and I grew up in New York City in the various boroughs. As a kid, I would ride my bike to the water. I, I see the changes in the ecology. Um, I've seen, you know, like I have pieces here that are composed with garbage from the beach. And there's a video, I think it'll be streaming as well, picking up the plastic from the beach. And I forget what year it is, but it's an older piece. 
Um, you know, I mean, it's food for thought and food for making art, but in the meantime, it's this critical climate catastrophe on our doorstep. And, you know, not to be overwhelmed by it, by it, but to be energized to make some change and to do something and not to accept the, um, the status quo. Yeah, and that's, you know, that is, and that's something that really, really excites me about the show because, I, because when you go through the exhibition, you know, there is, a, there's, there is something, you know, I feel that, that's being asked of the visitor as well, not just not, um, it isn't. It isn't. It isn't. It isn't a conversation you're having with yourself. It's actually a conversation you're having with the public, and, and, I, and this is something really. I feel it's, it's tremendous and very important about you know about the work you've been doing. It's kind of it's really very exciting about this piece. And um, yes, and I agree. We should. You know, we we do have some sort of agency. Well, one one of the things that I think. I mean, obviously, I'm not changing the government. I'm not in a position like that. You know, I do the demonstrations. I make the artwork. But I hope that the art makes issues visible. And whether it's an historical issue, whether it's a current issue, I mean, the way that cell phones allowed us to see, you know, the little video clips of these interactions, you know, they're not new. These are not new interactions, but they became, they came to the, you know, the front of one's consciousness because you could see them. Um, and that's incredibly powerful. So I'm hoping that the artwork helps people see issues and that, you know, one may change it. It's, you know, it's also, I also hope to make the work that gives some pleasure and that you can delight in the aesthetics of it uh, and enjoy the experience and not just be depressed by rising water. Well, you do. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it is, I find it, I find it, even though it, the topics may be very strong and you may want, you may want cause someone to want to pull their hairs out because it might seem insurmountable right there, but they're also, but, you know, but you, but they're, you know, they're, the way that he, that he sent out these messages, it's very beautiful, but it's also very powerful. Um, and, you, and there is something like, you know, you, you, know, you do not want the visitor, you, know, you, you cannot surrender. We have, we, have to be, we have to be kind of strong. Um, you know, whatever, whatever, what, whatever we do counts. I, and that's, I think, I think that's something, yeah. that, that we, I think that's a good place to end. I think whatever you do, whatever we do in our world, and whatever, we, whatever small action we do matters, because I feel that's something, <coughs> When we look going back to the we and water and where you're talking about the heroes, <coughs> and we and when you, when we described it about people who've influenced your life, mm -hmm. and and and, uh, and I think we kind of sort of just, just heroic odes, we were we were calling attention to that. You know, yeah. that, we, that, we, that this that, <coughs> that the that these that these individuals who've come across matter. And, 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 and have been making a difference. Well, several of those individuals in that drawing I discussed, I mentioned were my former students. And I think, I believe I helped them gain some agency in making art and making the world a better place. Yes. <coughs> well, I think this might be a good place for us to end. And um, you know, I would say thank you again, Marina Gutierrez, for bringing this show together. Um, bring it to Taller Puerto Rico. <coughs> I'll cough my way out. <laughs> well, I'll be feel better. Hopefully, the water will help. Uh, well, again, I would like to say that um, Marina Gutierrez, Another World Exists, will be on view through January 14, uh, 2022. Um, again, Taller Puerto Rico is open. Please visit our website um, for more information about visiting hours. Uh, um, is there any um, special requests about coming to the <coughs> show? Please let us know. We're here, here to assist you. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors um, that, that helped to make this exhibition possible. Uh, this exhibition and this program is made possible through the generous funding from the Andy Warhol Foundation of the Vis for the Visual Arts, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, PNC Arts Alive, 
in the Joseph Robert Foundation. And now, Dominic, could you please go to your screen, next, please? Um, this, is, this is an exhibition about, about Taya Podrykenia, and I will like say just one more last, say just one thank again, everyone who's helped <coughs> the show possible, Dominic Moret, and, 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 and Joseph here with our, with our show. And then and at the end of December, December 3rd, here's our fundraising, which will be the, Dominic, if you can show that last slide. Um, you can visit the Kenya for more information about the Paranda. Um, this is the Paranda, which we're about celebrating about our 20th year. Um, it's a very special occasion for your day at Kenya. Again, thank you for visiting us and be attending this, this artist talk. Uh, we will be posting this online. So if you wish to visit it, please do so. Thanks again. <laughs>